This week on Dialogue, integrating development, population, health, and the environment. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Our guests are Jeff DeBelko, director of the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, Roger Mark D'Souza, vice president for research and director of the climate program for Population Action International, and George Strunden, George's vice president of Africa programs for the Jane Goodall Institute. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Good Jeff, let's begin with a little bit of definition. And, and first, I guess, for the benefit of our viewers and listeners, uh, briefly tell us about the Environmental Change and Security Program that you direct here at the Wilson Center. Well, uh, thank you, John. Uh, we are a 16-year-old program that tries to bring together these different topics and the communities that are working on them in terms of population health, development, and environment and try to understand the, how they link in analytical and research terms and then how they link in the practical uh, worlds of people living around the world with a, a particular focus on uh, the world's poor. The term we use in the introduction, the integrated development, which I borrowed shamelessly from the uh, program you're going to be running here later today. Mm -hmm. uh, give us a definition of that. What are we talking well, about? Well, it's a sense that so many times that we tackle uh, development or, or poverty and human well-being challenges that quite naturally we do it in an individual sector, so a health sector or an agriculture sector or looking at issues of water scarcity. And it makes sense in many, res uh, re many respects to take those individual focuses. But of course, people living <laughs> in these challenges, um, they're living them together and they interact. And so both in terms of understanding the challenges, we need to look at them in an integrated fashion. And then responding to those challenges, we have to find ways that we can uh, bring our responses together and meet those challenges together uh, to hopefully be more effective in, in addressing very real problems. So in some ways what you're describing is the, the work on the ground these, that's occurred in these silos, mm -hmm. trying to get the silos to recognize that there's overlap, because in the real, in real world there is. Absolutely, in part so that we can uh, have synergies and achieve greater than we might in the individual sector responses, but also because if we ignore the links, then at times we can really miss opportunities or even be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And so if we have an agricultural program and we don't take account to long-term trends in water availability by looking at what climate change means for it, what looking uh, at the population growth figures are, what the consumption trends are, then if we just do that straight agriculture project, then we're going to miss a lot of stresses and a lot of change that really fundamentally impact how we take, a, take on that program. Roger, Mark, is this a, a, would you call this a movement? Are we starting to see more organizations begin to understand what Jeff just described and find ways to work together? Thank you very much, John. I, it's interesting that you ask whether we would see it as a movement. I, I don't think it's up to us to determine whether it's a movement or not. Uh, the work that we do at Population Action International is really focused on conveying the voices from of, of the most vulnerable people in developing countries and bringing that voice to Washington. And, and part of what we hear from our partners in these developing countries is that this is how we live our lives, as Jeff was saying. So I think it is something that people live and they experience on a daily basis. They don't see it as a movement, per se they see it as their lives. And this is very much what we bring to our work here. George, uh, in, in the field, is there resistance on the ground? I mean, in other words, if people are looking for certain types of services, say, uh, managing natural resources within their community or uh, 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 family planning, do they see overlaps among these various things or do they themselves become part of the problem of the silos? They definitely see the, the linkage between the, the sectors. Um, the communities where we typically work in are very remote uh, places. And uh, so, so they don't get uh, government services. There are not many organizations working in these places. So, so when they see uh, someone coming in to, to work with them, they uh, have their priorities in mind. There, there are usually multiple issues, uh, health, education, access to capital. Uh, which is important to them. And um, 
So, so we decided since uh, the mid-90s that uh, to, to, to deal with the issues we are uh, interested in, which is conservation, um, we have to, to uh, enter a dialogue with the, with the people affecting uh, our objectives and uh, to be able to, to lead this dialogue we, we have to address issues which are priorities to people, which is not one sector usually. Are, are there, is there resistance among uh, organizations based on competition for resources? I mean, we're talking about a lot of not-for-profit institutions mm -hmm. who are trying to raise money for their efforts. Do they see a threat in this type of integration because then uh, Organization A and Organization B might be trying to work the same funders? I, I would say uh, potentially that's there, but I think a, a larger impediment is um, many organizations, whether they are government bureaucracies, NGOs, or field-based organizations, have a focus and have a specialty. And they know what they can do, and they have a sense of the problem. And so part of the challenge is that one has to be conversant in the language and the tools and the analysis of multiple problems and bring that together. Um, and uh, while they're related at the end, they may not be so related at that, the That's right. Of and, and so part of that is learning uh, language. Part of that is finding support, whether it's from formal donors or from communities for integration. And so sometimes the, the resources that you have available don't allow you to play across these different topics. And so it becomes a practical impediment. There's recognition and a willingness, but it's uh, it's an inflexibility in how we approach these, which is part of what we try in our Washington discussions is to make those aware who are in the role of trying to support these community-led efforts that really they can they can uh, be much more effective if they have more creative ways to understand how to meet a specific objective. That working across the topics. Uh, ultimately can get them what they want in their narrow construction uh, while meeting broader needs. Speaking of effectiveness, what, what do we know? Has this, no, uh, has this notion been around long enough where we can measure effectiveness and compare it to the old way, the silo way? And also, I imagine that there would be some cost effectiveness involved, too, of, of uh, working together. Um, I, I would say definitely what we've seen, even though these projects have been around for roughly 10 or 15 years, what we've been able to demonstrate is that there are clear economies of scale, there are benefits in terms of costs involved in initial capital costs, that there are uh, benefits that uh, accrue to the communities where we work, because they say if we work in an integrated manner, we don't need to attend separate uh, community meetings on an environmental issue or a health issue because you've brought them together we have to give up less time ourselves so that we can it's, it's more beneficial to us and we have seen that there's a greater impact because there's longer sustainability for those efforts that have an integrated approach this creativity that Jeff talks about from the inception once you have that from the inception those projects tend to be more sustainable and there's more local community buy-in and a more a greater desire to see that that would more continues. sustainable because of a critical mass of, because of, of a critical mass but because of a desire to find mechanisms to generate revenues through their own initiatives and there's a greater understanding and a greater appreciation of the value that those projects bring so there's a greater mass but a stronger desire hmm. to see that the work continues and that is because it comes from the communities themselves which is exactly the point you're making this is what communities want. So because we're responding to that, it continues. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Could, well, I'd, I'd urge Roger Mark to talk about some of your work in the Philippines, particularly mm -hmm. with the mayors, because it then goes from a, a, a supply side uh, approach right. to really a demand side approach and solving yeah. problems that they, they have. So a lot of the projects that, that we have been involved in the Philippines have been um, integrated coastal resource management projects that address ways that you can improve coastal resources, mangrove reforestation, fisheries management that's tied to food security, well-being, uh, land use planning, and also thinking about how you provide access to family planning services and what that means. So many of the communities that have been involved in these efforts have recognized that these have been primarily 
poverty alleviation programs that have conservation objectives. But when the mayors recognize that this is really what the communities want, and because there's a very decentralized system in the Philippines, the mayors have then established this as a priority. And they're allocating from their budgets specific opportunities for integration. And then because they're having successes at that level, they then encourage other mayors to adopt this approach. So there's a sharing among the mayors, among the local decision makers, and it's responding to their constituents' needs, and they're able to clearly demonstrate that their results in terms of poverty alleviation. So it, it then becomes very popular, and, and I'm reluctant to say it's exactly a movement, right. but it, it, you sort of see a sense of um, it's something that's working and working well. George, what, what examples could you provide from the programs that the Goodall Institute's involved in in Africa that are similarly demonstrate how integration works? Yeah. We found that uh, we, we get uh, much stronger collaboration with the communities if we uh, seriously uh, address the, the issues raised by the communities. Um, in the beginning, when we started, uh, anything related to, to planting trees, protecting certain areas, um, created some resistance because the people felt that, that we are um, trying to take resources away to them, limiting access to certain resources for them, which uh, affects their income, and then there was a certain reluctance. And um, by, by focusing on, on issues which were express priorities to the communities, um, the relation we, we built with them over the years helped us then to, to address uh, conservation issues in a much more effective way. And um, so in an area where there was a strong resistance against uh, protecting forest, we, we have established a forest reserve uh, crossing over 15 villages. Um, each of the, the Justin villages contributed a specific area of their village land to that forest reserve on an entirely voluntary uh, basis. Mm. Um, and uh, that forest reserve is connected to a national park and it has real uh, conservation impacts uh, in that area. And then that was uh, true in our belief. We believe that this was made possible through the, the work we did in other sectors. How much of the, the approaches you take uh, are, are in the developing world are built on learning from the mistakes made in the developed world? <laughs> the well, the the use of the wise use of of the natural resources you have to your disposal. There, there have been many mistakes in, in the developed world. Um, the the deforestation of the Mediterranean forests, uh, and then which still impact uh, the resources that they have at their disposal today, and that happened two thousand years ago. Um, so, so there, there are, of course, uh, many examples where, where well-educated uh, people uh, used resources in a not sustainable way. Um, but um, we have other ways to, to compensate against that loss because we are not, our societies and economies are not based on, on natural resources as much uh, as, as uh, a farming community in Africa. So, so if um, uh, farmers in Africa overexploit or exploit their natural resources in a destructive manner uh, that affects their livelihood in a much stronger way than, than it would affect us. One of the things that I, over the years I find most fascinating about your work, Jeff, is that generally in, in popular culture, when we think of environmental issues, it's isolated to specific things. Uh, it's a, a, a nuclear power plant problem, or it's a, a polar bear on, a, on an ice floe, or something like that. But your work brings all these things together, and then sometimes it talks about the unintended consequences or mm -hmm. the longer-term trends. And so my, my thought here, and Roger Mark, I'll ask you to weigh in first, and maybe all of you could comment. It, in talking about the environment as a concern, mm -hmm. as something to be protected, maintained, is, is uh, population growth the ultimate X factor? Is this the thing that really drives everything else, energy needs? food needs, water needs. Is, 
You've been it's, involved it's, in organizations that look at yes, both. I think it's a very good question. It's a question that has been posed for a very long time. Um, certainly, nothing original. Here. Nothing original, <laughs> but it's a very good question. Um, th there's a clear sense that population is a very important multiplying factor, and I should say that when we think about population, we're not only thinking of directly population growth, but also composition, the age composition oh, uh, sure. of the population, yeah. the demographics, and how that population is distributed. So we're looking at urbanization trends, for example. When we look at coastal areas internationally, many of these areas are now urban coasts. So we talk about urban coasts and urban cities and what that means on the coastline. So population dynamics is a key critical factor to looking at environmental impacts. I'll get each of you also to weigh in on this, since this is the big overarching question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the um, one of the key points to remember is that, as Roger Marcus said, it's a it's a key variable. It's not the only variable. And when we oversimplify the causes of our problems, then we do ourselves a disservice. We have to understand that the population variables are relevant, and of course the consumption variables are relevant. Uh, so but how much we're consuming, yeah, how much that popul that growing population is consuming. So we have growth, we have growth of, uh, of, of middle class uh, in, in some of the emerging economies like India and China that are consuming more, uh, consuming at rates that start to um, uh, approximate what developed countries already are consuming and so it's the combination of more people consuming at higher rates some already consuming at very high rates such as us in the United States and those variables have to be looked at together they're often set up as either ors either consumption or population um, and that's a false dichotomy and we don't unfortunately have the luxury of just taking on one or the other the scope of the challenges require that we put it all together and, and address them both George, your thoughts on this uh, notion of population? Well, uh, I agree with Roger, Mark, and, uh, and uh, Jeff on that. Population is definitely a very important issue, but, but not the, the only one. Um, I, I liked what, what Jeff said about the, the, the consumption in, in developed countries and emerging economies like, like in, in China and India. And um, from a conservation perspective in Africa, that has direct implications. So the, the need for natural resources from, from China especially, but uh, probably uh, more and more from India as well, um, is uh, felt in, in remote areas in, in Africa. So, so there's a strong uh, interest in, in having access to land, uh, setting up commercial large-scale farming enterprises. Um, the, the oil palm industry is, is uh, interested in Central Africa more and more. And then we have seen the, the destructive uh, impact on the environment in, in uh, Asia. Um, uh, so so there, there are many issues with which impact uh, unsustainable use of natural resources. Um, but um, population is an important, but not the only one. Yeah. What, are the, what are the things people should be thinking of? Help us connect the dots. In other words, if population is only one of the things, uh, what would be a, a top three priority list as you look around the planet in areas that are in most crying need of focus and attention? Well, I, I think it's it's uh, you could look at food and 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 say we have um, in many ways we grow enough food to feed the world's population, but they're, it's they're a distribution distributional problem. and and the ability to purchase that food. But even given the growth in population and in consumption, um, that that's going to become more and more difficult, particularly as we then cross challenges around the availability of water. Uh, and availability of water that's going to become uh, certainly more variable and in, in as a, a, a loose sense, the dry place is getting drier and the wet place is getting wetter under many of the climate change scenarios. And so in that sense, you could put food at the top, but you could also put water at the top. You could put the biodiversity loss at the top, but really it's the intersection of them and understanding that they are critical to our social, economic, and political developments in ways that uh, we commonly don't appreciate, again, because we treat issues as discrete and uh, kind of 
in their each in their own box and not how they fit together. Are there other areas you see as environmental problems that might not immediately come to mind? For people? Well, I would say another area that that comes to mind, and I don't know that I would say it's an environmental problem per se, but I would say cost-effective interventions that have proven to be effective over time. And I particularly think of family planning, which is very much of a surprise for environmentalists mm -hmm. when when they hear this, but. 215 million women in developing countries want access to contraception and are not currently using contraceptive methods. So there's really a missed opportunity here. And I've just returned from Ethiopia and met a young woman there who's 29 years old, has 12 kids, and said to me, I today have the knowledge. I have now I'm using contraception, and I am also learning that my environment is changing because of climate change impacts, and I'm learning how to develop um, um, drought-resistant crops, I'm doing rainwater harvesting, and I'm using contraception. And I'm telling other young women about this so that they are not having 12 children like I did and that they're learning what they can do, what are some cost-effective interventions that we can voluntarily implement to have an impact now. That's powerful. That's enormous. We know it can work. It's not very expensive, and it has benefits across numerous scales. That's very exciting. The, uh, well, I'll, I should let you respond to this question before I ask you another one. Did you want, do you want to add anything to this discussion? <clears throat> well, in, in areas where we work, uh, food security uh, is, is definitely uh, top of the agenda. And when then, you say food security, what does that phrase mean? For, I mean, in the United States, people think of food security as, you know, tainted food or, or potential terrorist attacks on food supply. But are you, t are you talking about something different? No, um, it's uh, food security is um, the, um, the safety of the harvest. So, so the majority of smallholder farmers in Africa, which is the majority of the people in Africa, uh, depend on, on rain-fed agriculture. Mm -hmm. And um, rain-fed agriculture uh, depends on, on rainfall, as it said. And, and uh, there are already today quite strong variations in, in these patterns, which might get worse in, in the future. And um, so, so people, uh, subsistence farmers, don't have uh, access to, to, to buy food. They, they grow what they eat. After the harvest, they store it. So, so an insect infestation is a huge threat to them. Um, the um, the uh, harvest uh, mist is uh, the, the family goes hungry right away. They have to move to other areas to, to with relatives. There, there are certain mechanisms how to cope with that. But um, the, um, to, to have a, a secured access to, to food to survive, that, that is uh, one of the Basic big issues. Basic access, yeah. so not always. I'm going to ask in our, we probably have about five minutes left for our discussion, and uh, what I'm wondering is what you see as the most hopeful developments and trends. Are there technologies that are uh, emerging that can really make a difference here? Are there movements, or, or is it, what can you identify? I always like to leave people with uh, some hopeful information before we end, um, and it's not all bad news. Uh, Jeff, you want to start? Well, I, I guess I would uh, pick up on Roger Mark's last point, which is there. It is um, it is tempting when we look at the kind of dire nature of the statistics to kind of throw up your hands and say it's hopeless. Big problems. Yeah. yeah, and they are very, very big problems, but there is often, uh, most often, driven from uh, innovations on the people most affected, these kind of uh, um, from the ground, uh, there, there are ways to address them. They require some creativity. They require that we um, <clears throat> think outside of our knowledge areas, our toolboxes, that we find new friends and engage in different, uh, engage different sectors, whether it's the private sector and, and technology approaches, whether it's um, uh, the well, in this case, the population, the health, the environment, the development period. Those are very different communities. But we're finding instances where, on the ground, they're finding ways to work together to really address these challenges that uh, is uh, about empowerment rather than penalty in terms of the environment. So often these challenges, well, you, thou shalt not do X as the solution. Find the polluters. And in this case, like it's, that, yeah, yeah, in this case it is uh, empower people to, to take these Get it issues right. on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I would agree with that. And, and part of it is to empower people, but part of it is uh, seeing people empowering themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was talking about this recent trip to Ethiopia, and I was quite struck as I was chatting with one young woman who was telling me about the environmental club at her primary school. And she's standing in front of her mud hut, and I'm talking to her, and she says, Roger Mark, you have to understand, we in my village recognize that we have a moral imperative to reduce our CO2 emissions <laughs> wow. because we're looking to the future for our children. So it's, it's interesting that there's this woman standing in front of her mud hut coming to this realization, taking action, not seeing that she's we a victim. We need a bit of that with the McMansions right. here. I think. <laughs> but then passing that on to her children. Yeah. So seeing self-recognition, self-empowerment, and youth and developing young leaders. And that is happening. It's very exciting and very empowering. George, what are the most hopeful things you see or any specific new technologies or things like that you might identify? Yeah, at the, the moment we, we are looking at uh, mobile technology and, and social networks. Um, so so the, one of the challenges we face is uh, we, we have experiences, we, we have approaches which we think are very uh, successful. Um, so the challenge is how to bring them to scale now. And um, the, the cost of, of uh, reaching many people in very remote areas um, is very expensive. Um, and uh, the, the way we, we operate it now is, is too personnel intensive, too, too uh, transport uh, equipment dependent. And uh, we feel that uh, the, the new approaches to, to use uh, applications based on, on the, the mobile networks which are spreading in Africa. And um, so, so 10 years ago, uh, no one had a cell phone. Today you have hundreds of cell phones in each village. Every farmer has access to a cell phone. Um, and the same in, in the health sectors. So, so we work with the community-based distributing agents who are um, um, sending reports to us on paper. Um, so so to, to handle all these paper reports is a challenge. So it's a mobile technology both ways, to, to reach people, but also to get feedback from them on, on their needs, on uh, what they did, what they uh, um, achieved, uh, has, has an enormous potential um, to, to uh, improve uh, impact, to, to reduce cost to reach people. And, and we, are, we are currently looking at that and, and are very excited about that. Well, gentlemen, thank you. It's a, it's almost, it almost seems like a race uh, throughout time of our creative abilities and our destructive impulses, and mm -hmm. if one can stay ahead of the other. But thank you for your important thank work you. and for thank uh, you, John. speaking with us today. Thank you, John. Uh, we'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.